Okay, let's get started here. Let's walk through an example of a single sample proportion test. Now, if you watched the video that had this bundled in with the first part, uh, with the first video, um, you know, maybe don't watch that one anymore. It had some problems, so I've tried to fix those problems here. Inference for a single proportion involves, is usually done with a hypothesis test, and with that hypothesis test, we calculate a Z observed. In this case, we call it Z P hat. You can call it Z observed. Whatever, it's the same thing. So you calculate this Z observed value, which is just your proportion from your sample, P observed or P hat, minus your null hypothesis proportion divided by the standard error of the proportion. There's that neat, tidy little formula for the standard error of the proportion. A confidence interval is always your sample estimate plus or minus a Z or a T type thing times a standard error. So in this case, it's your, your, your point estimate is your proportion from your sample, and that is plus or minus uh, the z critical for your confidence interval, which is not always the same as for your, uh, is not always the same as for a hypothesis test. For a 95% confidence interval, it will be 1.96, and then you multiply that times the standard error of the proportion, which will be the same value here as it is up here. So if you're doing both, you can just save that value there if you're doing them by hand. So this is how we do those, um, those calculations, and then the process is logically exactly the same as for a single sample t-test, it's just that we're using proportions instead of means. Everything's the same, including the fact that we are using the normal approximation. We, use, we assume that the uh, sampling distribution of the proportion <coughs> is a normally distributed thing, so we use z. So everything else is exactly the same. So let's see if we can walk through an example here. This example is based on a weird interaction I had while working in an a lab I was working in back at Ohio State when I was a grad student, but I've made up the values and um, heavily modified the reality. The reality wasn't quite this dramatic. It is, however, true that in Columbus, Ohio, where Ohio State is, there are 60,000 students, and then they have friends and family who come in from out of town, and in the big games afterwards, there are riots. It's not people with masks over their faces running, throwing Molotov cocktails type riots. It's more like 20,000 people standing on high street with beers in their hands, um, chatting and dancing and stuff. However, some bad things happen. Some people get sexually assaulted. Uh, I had a student, um, some fights break out. I, I had a student get her car overturned and burned by some people who were getting a little too much into the party spirit of things. And turns out insurance does not cover that. On the other hand, I also had some students who were on their balcony watching what they said was a very peaceful party down below them, and the police came in with uh, riot gear and shot tear gas into their apartment because apparently they didn't like people watching. So it's a really contentious type situation there, and it's become more and more militarized, and the police are trying to improve their public image. Now, let's imagine then that the police department goal, this is totally made up, in Columbus has a is a goal that they would have... Um, complaints from fewer than 15% of the interactions that they have with uh, with residents during those riots post-game. It only happens after certain big games, and so, but they make the news and they, and they make the department look bad. So let's say they take, the data analyst takes a random sample from their files, a computer or paper files or whatever they have, of 100 interactions that police have where they talk, stop and talk to somebody or arrest somebody or help somebody or whatever it is, or put out one of the 300 couch and dumpster fires that happen that night. It's pretty crazy. Seriously, 300. Let's say that 12% of those 100 interactions generated complaints of this random sample. Let's say there are lots and lots of, of these interactions that happened that night, and 12% of them generated complaints. So is the department meeting its goal? And let's set alpha 0.05 to give our, ourselves a good chance to find out if we're meeting our goal to reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis here will be that the true proportion of interactions that generate a complaint is 0 .5, 0 0.15. Now, conceptually, it's 0.15 or greater, but since we're just going to test on the negative side, we're only going to look for proportions that are lower than 0.15, then it's okay to not have that range, but to just have a single value as our proportion there. The alternative hypothesis is that the true proportion is what the police department hopes it is, less than 0.15. We have conditions and assumptions here, just as we do with uh, every other kind of test or every other kind of inferential procedure. And they're pretty easy to test, and they're pretty easy to consider. Sometimes you get in a pickle where it's hard to test them, but in this class it'll be pretty easy to see if something's going on. It's normality and independence, just like for a t-test. But we test the normality a little strangely. You don't look at histograms, you don't look at QQ plots, because as it turns out with proportions, there are very strict rules for when things are normal and when things are not normal. 
And with the proportion, it's all dependent on the balance, the heads-tails balance, the yes-no, the success-failure balance. So you've always got a binary data for a binary variable for a proportion test, which means everybody is in one of two categories. And so the success failure condition is what determines whether the sampling distribution of the proportion is is uh, more or less normal, or very normal actually in most in most circumstances. And so there need to be at least ten of each thing. So if your if your groups are defined by male versus female, there need to be ten males and ten females at least. If it's defined by people who said yes or no on a questionnaire, you need to have ten people who said yes and ten people who said no. In this case, it needs to be ten. Uh, 10 interactions in the sample generated a complaint and 10 did not, at least. It can be anything bigger than that, but it needs to be 10. And then we look at independence, which as it turns out, impacts normality as well. But the, the independence conditions, we check them the same as before. First, just look at the sampling. If there's any hint that there were weird things going on in the sample that caused things to be non-normal, or sorry, non-independent, where one observation was or case was selected uh, in a way that impacted the probability of selecting another case, well then we should consider that non-independent, but most of the time that doesn't happen because most most of the time the sampling is pretty reasonable. Even non-random samples are usually not uh, violating independence seriously. And then we want to make sure the sample is not more than 10 percent of the population size. So as I mentioned it's kind of odd that the independence condition for proportions actually affects normality because proportions they behave strangely. They have different sets of rules with them. So uh, in this example, we can check our success-failure condition. We can see that the random sample generated 12% of those interactions generated complaints. 12% of 100 is 12, so that's, that's greater than 10. And then the other side, so that would be like the success condition or failure, whatever. And then the other side, the success condition, 88 without complaints. So those are each greater than 10. That's fine. Each of them is greater than a number. It's not a proportion or percent. It's just greater than 10, just the number 10. And the independence condition, there's no reason to suspect any weird shenanigans. However, with proportions and with this particular case, you might want to check because it people can select data in ways that aren't really independent. So you would, you would want to check this and talk to people who got collected your data for you and make sure they did it right. And the sample is probably less than 10% of the population, but you might want to check that too. What population are you generalizing to? If you're generalizing to just the interactions this one night, your sample might actually be more than 10% of all those interactions. There might not have been 1,000 interactions on that one night. However, they're probably trying to generalize to, say, all the interactions that happen over a course of maybe a couple of years. Uh, and, and then there will definitely be more than 1,000 interactions, probably. So you'd want to talk to somebody and make sure that that is actually met. So let's assume that's satisfied so we can move on with our example here. The null hypothesis mean, we could call it P0 instead of mu0, but it's the mean of the sampling distribution of proportions. So we could call it P0 or mu0. Uh, it's 0.15 because that's the value we're testing against. That's the value we don't want to, we, we don't want to be at that value. It's not our friend. The uh, sample proportion is 0.12 in this case, and Z critical, one-tailed, negative, Actually, that should be negative 1.65, not positive 1.65. I'm getting sloppy. So the standard error of the proportion, 0.12 times 1 minus 0.12 over 100, square root of all that, that works out to be 0.03, more or less. And so then we calculate our Z for our proportion, for our observed proportion there, our Z score. And if I did my math right, it ends up to be negative 0 0.92, and that's not enough. We needed negative 1.65 or less to be in the rejection region. But that's not enough, because we wanted the proportion to be much less than 15, but it wasn't enough less than 15. 0.12 is not enough less than 15, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis. So sadly, Columbus Police Department, in this imaginary fake made-up situation, we would say they were not meeting their department goals. So the evidence does not support the hypothesis that the true proportion is uh, lower than 0.15. We don't have to worry about higher because we just never would have considered that to be successful to a successful outcome in the first place. So, yeah, didn't really work out. But let's calculate a confidence interval and see what kind of a situation we're actually looking at. Let's do the 90% the 90 confidence interval just because that 1.65 will be the same. Now, we had 1.65 as our confidence, as our um, Z critical, and that put 5% in one tail of the hypothesis test. But let's put 5% in both tails of the confidence interval. Why not? It's nice and parallel. 
So we plug in the numbers. We get 0.12 plus or minus 1.65 times the standard error there. And we get 0.066 and 0.174. Now with proportions, it's kind of nice to carry things out to about three decimal places at the very end, because then you can have something, something, point something percent, which is a nice level of precision for percentages. And often people report things as percentages in this. So we would say we're 90% confident that the true proportion, et cetera, 6.6% and 17.4%. Next time, we'll talk about two proportions.